Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Gospel Eschatology. I'm your host, Michael Sullivan. You can find me at fullpreterism.com or my Patreon account is patreon.com slash Mike J. Sullivan. And you can support my ministry there if the Lord puts that on your heart. Hey, I was just listening to last week an interview by Tucker Carlson. Uh, he's interviewing, he's going on a tour and he's interviewing different uh, patriots. And one of them was Glenn Beck. Of course, Glenn Beck is a Mormon. And they were talking about all the problems that we're having by the globalists. And the issue of Bible prophecy came up. And it kind of took me back to some memories I had at the Master's College when a Mormon apologist visited our school and some of the interaction that the class had with him on prophecy and failed prophecy. And then my interaction with him later on that evening, as I had just become a full preterist, had only been a full preterist one week, didn't know if there was anyone out in the world that believed what I believed, but I was going to take what I knew and interact with this Mormon. And I'm gonna get into that in a second, but let's listen <clears throat> to what Tucker and Glenn Beck are saying and the implications of what they're saying about the second coming of Christ. And apparently Jesus and definitely the apostles were in error. Let's listen to this. That's important. Yeah, here. But let me just skip to the end of the story. Are you hopeful? And if so, why? So, hmm. Uh, Ooh, that's not the answer I was looking for, Glenn. <laughs> oh, I'm hopeful. It's going to be great. <laughs> uh, this is the weirdest thing that happened in my life. I sat with some biblical scholars, some real scholars. Um, Wonder who these scholars might be. I mean, it really, at this point, it doesn't matter if they're Mormon Bible prophecy experts or the Hal Lindsey, uh, John Hagee ones, because they're all teaching the same garbage at this point, all right? And we were talking about, they were teaching me about the end times. Oh. And I, the whole time I'm like, this sounds familiar. I think I'm seeing some of this now. Newspaper astrology. Uh, and we got to the end and we were all crying because it, it, it could be, I, everybody always says this, you know, the apostles said this and they were wrong. So okay, right there, the apostles said this and they were wrong. Now, according to John chapter 14 and John chapter 16, the Holy Spirit was going to be given to the apostles. All right. To lead them into all truth concerning things to come. The Holy Spirit was specifically given to the New Testament authors and the apostles to guide them into everything concerning the things to come, eschatology, the second coming of Christ. All right. So to say that they're, they were wrong is to deny the inspiration of scripture. And Tucker, bless his heart, he is not a theologian. I, I don't know where he is. I don't know how much he even studies his Bible, to be perfectly honest. But because he has no biblical knowledge, really, he's letting Beck just walk all over him. And he's not seeing the implications, really, of what Beck is saying. So, so far, all right, we have the doom and gloom. There's nothing we can do, really, to stop this. And the apostles were wrong. Likely very wrong on this. But it feels like... Feels. The end times. Enough of the signs are here that it could happen quickly. What sign? Um, and we stood there with each other, and we were all kind of blubbering. And uh, after that, somebody said, so what do we do? And I said, I have no idea. Really? I mean... Exactly. I mean, why polish brass on a sinking ship? What exactly can you do if this is all prophesied and that things are supposed to get worse and worse and worse? And yet Beck throughout this interview talks about us needing to stand up in our culture and to do the moral thing that's right. 
But why? If we're just going to lose, right? But I strangely feel so good because I know the ending. What an honor. Think of, think of this. For thousands of years, people have waited. The apostles said it was coming in their lifetime. The second coming of Christ. Okay, so the second coming of Christ was supposed to take place in the lifetime of the apostles. That's what Jesus taught, Matthew 16, 27, 28. For the Son of Man is about to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each man according to what he has done. Verily I say unto you, there are some standing here in the crowd who shall not taste death till you see this take place. Now, Mormons believe that there are some, that the apostle John is still roaming the earth because of this prophecy. There have even been charismatics that have received revelation that uh, John is still roaming the earth. They took a page out of the revelations of the Mormon church. That's how ridiculous this gets. But let's, uh, let's continue here. Go to the next clip. But I wonder, like, why would we be afraid of that? Well, that's the point of the book of Revelation. That's the point of prophecy. So you won't be afraid. Right, that's right. He's telling you, you, you you're not going to know the hour. But at the same time, let's not dismiss that he says, but look for these things. What because things, these things will happen mm. and you will know the hour is nearing. So what are, I mean, let's, let's, let's go through them. They what what are you noticing that makes you think this has been foretold? Uh, the breakdown of society. Okay, so let's break down this. So Tucker says, hey, look, we're not, we're, we're not going to know the day and hour, all right? Matthew 24, 36. But Jesus specifically says all of the signs, the signs that would not mark the end being near, these are just general signs that Glenn would say is marking that the end is near. And then there's two specific signs. That would be the gospel being preached in all the world and then the end, the end of what? Not the end of world history. Not the end of our world history, but the end of the old covenant age that is associated with the temple that they're looking at. When that temple was destroyed in AD 70, the old covenant age ended. The gospel had been preached throughout the Roman Empire, the world as they knew it. Colossians 1 verses 5 and 6 and verse 23. The gospel had been preached to every creature under heaven, heaven and to the whole world. Greek word gi and oike, oh, I'm sorry, oikimene there. Romans 1, uh, 10, 18 and Romans 16, 25 and 26. Again, the gospel had been preached in all the world. So that sign was fulfilled in the first century in Jesus's generation. That's when he said he would come. That's when he said all those signs would be fulfilled. The second specific sign is that when they would see the armies, the Roman army surrounding Jerusalem, then they were to flee the city. And that's exactly what they did. Eusebius tells us that they fled to Pella and were safe from that covenantal wrath that came upon the Jews when Christ came upon the clouds using the Roman armies. In the Old Testament, when God would come upon the clouds, he would use armies, the Assyrians, <clears throat> the Babylonians, etc. Also in the Old Testament, when God would come upon the clouds in judgment in a day of the Lord, not only would he come through um, armies, he said his coming would be soon, it would be near, and it would not be delayed. And in all of those instances, those terms meant that he came in the lifetime and generation of the prophet. For example, Ezekiel, see Ezekiel 7, see Ezekiel 12, see Ezekiel, I think it's 22, chapter 30, and chapter 32. All right. And the false prophets tried to twist the meaning of what near meant uh, by not it being fulfilled in their generation. And God chastised them and brought judgment upon them for even challenging the nearness of his prediction. So we have precedent in the Old Testament, what the day of the Lord means. The timing of it was always fulfilled, near, always meant the lifetime of the prophet and his contemporaries. And so when we move into the New Testament, Jesus is not teaching anything different. The New Testament authors aren't teaching anything different. And they're not wrong. 
the day of the Lord, the second coming was fulfilled exactly when Jesus said in his contemporary generation. Now, the day and the hour, they wouldn't know the day or the hour within that generation. All right. But the day and hour doesn't mean our day and hour. It meant that generation's day and hour. All right. So the sign and then he talks about he doesn't get into any signs. The only thing he talks about is, oh, you know, the the degrading of society. Well, wait a second. You know, I mean, Nero raped little boys and uh, put people in, in animal skins and raped them and and killed them and claimed that he was God. I mean, Kamala Harris is pretty bad. Joe Biden's pretty bad, but they're not demanding that we worship them. You know, uh, some of the empires, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, I mean, when they would come in and conquer a nation, they would they would pluck out their eyeballs, put big hooks into their body and chain and, and drag them around naked as slaves. I mean, that that's not really taking place today. So uh, this this whole argument, it's a very subjective argument. Well, our culture is so evil. It's always been evil. It's always been evil. OK, so. That doesn't fly. There's really nothing of substance here. So let's let's jump back into <laughs> what he just said. He just said he admitted that Jesus and the New Testament authors are basically false prophets. Now, this took me back to my memories of uh, being at the Master's College back in 1990 and 1991. When... Uh, a Mormon apologist named Ara came to the Master's College and he he brought his TV crew. I mean, that's how confident this guy was. He brought his TV crew, put it in the back of the class, had the camera on him and on the class. And this was in the apologetics class. First challenging question, the students raised their hands. Joseph Smith taught that the second coming was going to take place in his lifetime in his generation, all of the apostles of the Mormon church also taught that Jesus' second coming was going to take place in their lifetime, in their generation. It was a failed prophecy. <clears throat> Therefore, the Book of Mormon cannot be reliable and is not on par with Scripture. Now, what happened next is something the class was not expecting. Ara turned to him and said, well, I don't really know what the problem is here. Jesus taught that his second coming would take place in the lifetime and generation of the first century church. And all of the apostles that you guys hold as inspired taught that the second coming was going to take place in their lifetime and generation. So if my so if your prophets can be wrong and in your apostles can be wrong, why can't mine? You could have heard a pin drop. They got they hurried on to the next topic, archaeology errors or or whatever of the Book of Mormon, because they didn't want to deal with that at all. Now I had just become a full preterist. I had just interacted with David Chilton. He told me to read the Parousia by J. Stuart Russell. I read it. I didn't know if anyone believed that the second coming had taken place in 86. I didn't know what a full preterist was. Um, I kind of had Elijah syndrome, you know, me alone. I'm, I'm alone. And, and, you know, God had to remind me and show me, no, I have 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to this stupid futurist teaching. So anyway, I said, uh, Ara, is there any way I can... Uh, maybe have dinner with you. We can we talk a little bit more about this. And he thought, oh, great. I've got a, I've got a convert right here. So he said, why don't you come on over to dinner tonight? Me and my wife will cook you dinner and we'll talk some more about all this. I said, great. So I went over there and I knew, I, I was brand new. I, all I knew is God, I'm going to be faithful with the knowledge you've given me. And if I don't know something, if I don't know something, I don't know something. I'm just going to be faithful. So I went over there and I said, well, Ara, so you made a good case there to the class in the opening remarks about the prophecy of the second coming. I said, but you know what, Ara? It was a deflection because the only thing you could have proven was that not only are your prophets wrong, 
but that the New Testament prophets are wrong <clears throat> and that they all should be stoned. So you didn't solve, you didn't really answer the challenge. You just brought the same challenge to the class that didn't have an answer. So all you really proved is that all the apostles, the Mormon apostles, quote unquote, and the New Testament apostles should all be stoned, including Jesus. And he really, he, he saw that I saw the game he was, he was working there. And I said, let me show you something else. So we went through the Olivet Discourse and I said, the second coming did take place and let me show you how. And I, I went through it, I went through all the signs, I went through apocalyptic language, uh, what it means for the Son of Man to come upon the clouds and judgment. And he looked at me and he says, I, had n I have never seen this before. I, I don't have an answer for this. You're gonna have to give me some time. Well, I dropped out because I was tired of spending $13,000 and majoring in theology uh, that was horrific. Um, and so I didn't see Ara for a long, long, long time. And I was interacting with James White's assistant, Rich, and I was telling him this story. And uh, Rich says, oh, we, we know Ara. And uh, I got a hold of Ara on Facebook, I don't know, about five or 10 years ago, kind of. Uh, talked more about this. And I said, hey, Ara, I would like to debate you, have a formal debate on Daniel 9.24, because there it connects the office of prophet stopping or ceasing when the temple is destroyed in AD 70. And I'm going to, I'm going to prove that Mormonism can't even get out of the starting blocks. And he wouldn't do it. And he couldn't find me a Mormon apologist to debate that topic. So all to say, all right, uh, basically Christians are saying the same thing that the Mormons are. C.W. Uh, C.S. Lewis wrote, say what you like, we shall be told the apocalyptic beliefs of the first Christians have been proven to be false. It is clear from the New Testament that they all expected the second coming in their own lifetime. And worse still, they had a reason and one which you will find very embarrassing. Their master had told them so. He shared and indeed created their delusion. He said in so many words, this generation will not pass away uh, until all these things be done. And he was wrong. He clearly knew no more about the end of the world, false premise, than anyone else. It certainly is the most embarrassing verse in the Bible. Well, Jesus never prophesied the end of, of the world or the end of world history. He prophesied about the end of the old covenant age in his generation. So with that false premise, Christians like C.S. Lewis that are trying to be honest and struggling with the text have to admit that Jesus and the New Testament authors were wrong. They were led by the Spirit. They were inspired, but somehow they're wrong. Now, if you're an atheist, you're a Muslim apologist, you're a Jewish apologist, you're licking your lips when you hear Glenn Beck say what he said or C.S. Lewis saying this, because <clears throat> there's nothing left to Christianity. If Jesus and the New Testament authors are false prophets, you can't believe anything they wrote. And they surely weren't inspired. And that's where the Rockefellers come in, starting and funding the entire uh, skeptic movement. And that's exactly what they teach. And so they're trying to get Christians into their new world religion by saying, hey, look, it's not too bad. I mean, we still have some good morals kind of sort of in here. Now, just, you know, the Bible's wrong and Jesus was wrong and the New Testament authors are wrong, but come into the New World Order and, and we'll have our own state religion with some other kind of, you know, all, all roads lead to God type thing, which is really the state. So you can see the dilemma that Beck and even evangelicals are in because Deuteronomy 18.20 is pretty clear. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? 
when a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So false prophets that either led the people, said they were getting revelation that contradicted the scriptures, um, they were to be stoned and killed. Or if their prophecies didn't come true, they were to be stoned and killed and you were not to be afraid of them. So according to Beck's logic or lack thereof, and Tucker, who's just letting him walk all over him and has really no discernment here, or C.S. Lewis, it all comes back to this. Well, then they should have just stoned Jesus. Then they And they should have just stoned the New Testament authors. And we really shouldn't believe anything they say if indeed Jesus didn't come back when he said. Now, let's just for technical reasons, these would be some of the, now the class didn't have all this information like I do, but these are some of the things that they would have quoted from the Mormons. And uh, for just sake of argument and knowing Beck's background, let's go ahead and go through some of them. <clears throat> In the Doctrine and Covenants, chapter 84, verses 4 and 5, Joseph Smith received a supposed divine revelation on September 22nd, 23rd of 1832 that reads, Verily, this is the word of the Lord, that the city, the new Jerusalem, shall be built by the gathering of the saints, beginning at this place, even at the place of the temple, which temple shall be rendered or reared in this generation. For verily, this generation shall not all pass away until, notice he's using the same language as Jesus is using in Matthew 24, 34, regarding Jesus's contemporary generation. Now he's trying to say that that is his generation. And house shall be built unto the Lord and a cloud shall rest upon it which cloud shall be even the glory of the Lord, which shall fill the house. I'm not sure why all these spaces are being created when I upload my PowerPoints to Streamline, StreamYard. Um, in 1833, he said, my father presented himself. I asked him a father's blessing, which he granted by laying his hands upon my head in the name of Jesus Christ and declaring that I should continue in the priest's office until Christ comes. In other words, Christ's second coming was going to take place in the lifetime of this great prophet, Joseph Smith. <clears throat> Likewise, when the 12 apostles were ordained in the Mormon church, uh, some of them also received the same kind of revel revelation. The blessing of Laman E. Johnson was that he shall live until the gathering is accomplished and he shall see the Savior come and stand upon the earth with power and great glory. So he's going to live to witness it. William Smith as well. <clears throat> uh, I prophesy in the name of the Lord God and let it be written that the son of man will not come in the heavens until I am 85 years old, 48 years hence or about eight, 1890. It's getting real specific there in your revelations and prophecies. In 1835, Smith stated again, it was the will of God that those who went to Zion with the determination to lay down their lives, if necessary, should be ordained to the ministry and go forth to prune the vineyard for the last time. For the coming of the Lord, which was nigh even 56 years, should wind up the scene. This is really no different than how Lindsay, a charismatic who claims that the prophetic gift of, or the office of prophet is is still here, and him teaching that we're the gen, we're the terminal generation of Matthew twenty four that would see the second coming of Christ. This is all the same garbage, just repackaged within the cults. I will state as a prophecy that there will not be an unbelieving Gentile upon the continent fifty years hence. And if they are not greatly scourged in a great measure overthrown within five to 10 years from this date, here it is, then the Book of Mormon will have proven itself false. Of course, this quote unquote prophecy being the embarrassment that it is to the LDS 
quote unquote church has been conveniently deleted from any modern version of the writings of Parley P. Pratt, an alleged apostle and prophet. Um, and it just goes on and on and on. I mean, more and more date setting. And so ho hopefully, guys, you can see the serious ramifications of what um, of what Beck and Tucker are saying. And, you know, these guys, along with Alex Jones, tells us, tell us constantly, we've got to fight the new world order. We got to resist them. Right. But again, why? If it's been prophesied by God and there's no one that can, you know, go against his, his prophecy. If everything's in the newspapers is taking place right in front of us and we can't resist it, we can't fight it. It's prophesied to get worse and worse. Why should we get involved in culture? And what good would it do anyway? I mean, they all end up adopting why polish brass on a sinking ship philosophy because it just, that's why we've, our culture has just gone down, 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 and down ever since the rise of premillennial dispensationalism because they want the Battle of Armageddon. They want what they think is Gog and Magog. So they can get raptured off the earth. They don't want to get involved in culture. They don't want to do the hard work of creating things and going to school. Why? Jesus is coming back any minute. Any minute to whisk us off the earth. Beck uh, and his Mormonism, the Mormon church, are huge supporters of modern Israel. And because they think modern Israel is fulfillment of prophecy, they believe some really weird things about Israelites and Israel. They believe that Israelites came over here to the Americas. The Indians were Israelites. Somehow they are genetically connected to Israelites. And they really feel like they have to support Israel no matter what. I mean, it's just a part of their doctrine. And it's a part of evangelical premillennial dispensational doctrine as well. And that's why our politics is so messed up. The Rothschilds, the Talmudic Zionists, who are at the top of the food chain of the people, Glenn Beck in his book, The Great Reset, okay, Tucker Carlson talks about Klaus Schwab and The Great Reset. Alex Jones has written two books on the subject. These guys are not ignorant. They know that R Talmudic Rothschild Zionism is at the top of the pyramid food chain when it comes to the New World Order and the Great Reset and the globalist, Marxist, fascist agenda. All right. And yet they're playing right into their hands because the Albert Pike letter clearly says that they're planning to have World War III be between Israel and the Muslim world to create this world world battle and that they say when there is no second coming when nothing happens the christians the muslims and even some jews are going to be disillusioned with their religion and they're going to be vulnerable for their new world order religion that the rockefellers have been funding so you have the rockefellers funding the new world religion of the state and kind of this new age religion that they're trying to get christians into by saying prophecy never was fulfilled when it was supposed to. And then out of the, the other side, you have the, the Rothschilds funding the heresy of premillennial dispensationalism because they are their useful idiots. And our government is filled with them, all right? Even the, the ones that we think are conservative and are so good, they are walk, they're running us right down the road to what they think is Armageddon and Gog and Magog <clears throat> because they think they're going to get raptured. And it's insane, but these are the implications of having a really, really bad eschatology, okay? So let's get back to the Bible. Let's understand that Christ has already come. The battle of Armageddon and Gog and Magog was fought shortly in the book of Revelation. We're told that the events would be fulfilled shortly and quickly and soon and would not be delayed. 
it's anticipating a period of three and a half years when the city and the temple would be trodden underneath the foot of the Romans for three and a half years. That was fulfilled roughly between AD 67 and AD 70. Even the Dead Sea Scrolls tell us that the Jews, along with the Christians, believed that the Battle of Gog and Magog would be fought between the Romans and the and the Jews, the apostate Jews in Jerusalem. That's what the <clears throat> Essene community separated themselves from Jerusalem and said they're apostate. And this end time war is going to be between the Romans and them. But they believed that God was going to deliver them because they were the true children of life. No, God was going to deliver the Christians because they were the true sons of the day and the children of light. And so the New Testament is very consistent with what the Dead Sea Scrolls believed about the Battle of Gog and Magog. And Beck and Tucker are not, they don't know anything about the history of this time. They're, they're trusting these prophecy experts. These prophecy experts are about as expert as uh, Fauci is an expert in our health and health care. OK, you listen to Fauci about health care. Uh, our country only gets more and more diseased because he's a puppet of Rothschild Zionism that wants to make us sick, make us dependent upon them on the Rockefellers, Big Pharma. And they want to kill us and depopulate us and in the process, make a lot of money off of us. OK, so that that's what we're fighting. And unfortunately, Beck, Alex Jones and Tucker Carlson, when they think modern Israel is a fulfillment of prophecy and they support it, whether directly or indirectly, the Rothschilds have us and we have to break out of that. And the only way we're going to break out of it is if we get back to biblical eschatology. Full preterism, we uphold the inspiration and fallibility of scripture. We uphold the time statements as literal, just as they were in the Old Testament. We uphold that Jesus came upon the clouds apocalyptically through Romans, just like the Old Testament teaches. And that these things took place in the lifetime and generation of first century church. Christ is faithful. Now we have to actually get involved in our society, get involved in politics and expose these prophecy experts and these conservatives that just out of, out of one side of their mouth, they're telling us we have to attack these people. Out of the other side of the mouth, they're supporting them. Big problem, guys. Only full preterism has the solution. Please like this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. My YouTube channel is at Michael Sullivan 6868. Again, my Patreon account where I also am posting videos is uh, patreon.com slash Mike J. Sullivan. I could use your support because I would like to make more and more and more videos just like this one. Thank you and I'll see you in the next episode.